You know, before I start, I just want to say that um, what I want to share today, really, I got a kind of the Lord dropped in my spirit the other night as we were thanking him in our service on Wednesday night. And if you were here then, then you already got a prelude to the message today. But uh, I just haven't been able to shake that thought in my mind, in my spirit. Um, Thank you so much, Paul. Um, those days, and um, I've just spent the time really just meditating on the Lord and, and what he's saying, and, and actually didn't really give this any form till this morning, but I, I believe that the Lord wants to touch our lives. He wants to, you know, that we've been talking about revival, but God needs to start in us. You know, we, we, we spoke last week about the issue of humbleness. <laughs> Now, God needs to, we need to walk in humbleness. We look at Uzziah, and Uzziah, you know, started off good. He started off great. He did so many mighty things, and yet, later on in his life, he just realized or thought that he was the one that had done all these things. He forgot about the Lord. He forgot about how God had graciously helped him. Sometimes, you know, when we are in life, we get this thought that, you know, we're king's kids, and so we have this thought that we're entitled to something. You know, the, the Bible's clear that, yes, the, the, the Lord does provide for his people. Yes, he does care for his people. But there's another side of that, that, that if God, if we are not shaped by the things around us, um, there would be no reality to our faith. Um, you know, and it's through sometimes the difficulties and the struggles that we encounter that our real faith is tested, but it's also revealed what's in us. So, you know, as, as we share, I'm, I'm going to begin in the text in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, and just to sort of give this a context, Paul has been on his second missionary journey. Um, he had a particular plan in mind of where he was going and the Lord kept closing doors. Have you ever had the Lord close doors on you? No one's ever had the Lord close doors on you. You've never tried to pursue something and you found a brick wall. You, you never, you know, were, were moving down the lo- way, but you didn't even think that uh, you were getting there. Well, well, here the Bible's clear that Paul receives this vision uh, it's, it's in Acts 16, uh, B, verse 6 to 10, where he gets this vision that there's a man from Macedonia saying, come over to us to help us. And he saw that as the Lord's d- redirection in his life. In, in his life. And as he shared this with his team, they said, let's go. And the very first city that they really center on is Philippi. And Philippi, we see the, the baptism or the... Um, new life of Lydia, as she's baptized in the Christ. And, and she says, if, if you've seen me that I've been faithful, stay with me for a while. And, and so they were able to be housed in Lydia's house, and there Paul began to preach in Philippi. And we see uh, one of the encounters that he has with a slave girl. And that slave girl actually gets delivered of what she had been, you know, like a, I'll say it like a fortune teller, where she's telling her, her masters and they're making money off of her. But all of a sudden, she's delivered of this, and because of that, they are very upset with the gospel being preached. And so they confront Paul, and and we pick this up in in verse uh, 22. The multitude rose up together against them, meaning Paul and his team, and the magistrates tore off their clothes commanded them to be beaten with rods, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, you got to understand, God just spoke to Paul, right? This is a place where you're going to do ministry. This is a place that, that you know, uh, God is giving direction. And the very first city... The, the main city in this area of Macedonia, Paul gets beaten with Silas, beaten with rods, thrown in prison, not just the outer court of the prison where he can kind of walk around, he's thrown into the inner court of the prison where his feet are in stocks. So not only are they beaten badly and, and in pain, 
but they can't even move around. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced some kind of pain. Those of you that are women that have given birth, you understand what pain is. Maybe if you've had a, a kidney stone or something like that, you also understand what pain is. You can't sit, you can't stand, you can't do anything. But here, they had to be fastened to this place. You know, so not only is their idea of what God's calling them to do something, but at the same time, they suffer this tremendous blow. And, and life's like that sometimes. You know, we're moving in the things of God, and then they, there's some kind of blow that comes into our life, you know, sucks the wind right out of us, and, and then we're, we're called to continue on. And here's Paul, the apostle, the great apostle from the Lord, and yet here he is in prison. But look at this other verse, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Whenever there's a situation in our life, there's people that are watching. They were listening. They're listening to what's taking place. Look, the condition was common to all of them. Those that were in prison had all been beaten, had all been put in some time. Some of them because they deserved it. Some of them maybe that they had not deserved it. But they all understood this common place that they were. And they were beaten down. And now they had been bound and they're in prison. And their reaction could have been different than what it was. Instead of cursing, these captives, what did they hear? They heard the words of adoration and praise coming from the lips of Paul and Silas. You read the story, suddenly it says, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosened. Listen, you know, not only did Paul and Silas have their chains removed and, and the doors open, but it says everyone did. Here's what the Lord's showing me. There are many of us and around us that are in prison. I made some visitations on Wednesday. I did some calls on Thursday. I'm sorry, Tuesday. Visitations on Wednesday. I had hoped to do more, but I ended up stuck a little bit because we had a, an alarm problem, so I got delayed about three hours on, on Wednesday. But I, I made phone calls, people that have been out of church for a little while maybe, but, you know, because of one ailment or another ailment. And, and so, in a sense, they're kind of like stuck in their house. You know, and some of them declared it that way. It's like, I'm stuck here. You know, and, and you know, there, there should be a, a thing that, well, in the midst of this, praise the Lord, there's something I can do, right? You know, one, one fellow was calling somebody else that was stuck and he's encouraging them. The other person was stuck, was expecting other people to call him. There's something that happens with stuck. I visited you know, a couple of nursing homes, and, and you know, we just had received a nice card from um, Arthur and Marie, you know, wishing us a happy Thanksgiving. And, and there's Marie, day in and day out, visiting her husband. You know, but Marie is, uh, has a little pocket, she has Parkinson's, she has a little bent over, but she sits alongside of her husband. Her husband has Alzheimer's. Every day, he doesn't know if she went or didn't go. But, but she, he goes, uh, she goes and she stays with them because she says it's the right thing for me to do. And, and many people say, well, you need to take a break, you need to stay home. And, but this is her husband. And, and so she cares about him. And, you know, even though she sits there with her head bent over, as, as she talks to you, she's recalling the things and, and her mind is very sharp. But, but he's in captured in a, in, a, in a sort of prison. Because he's encased in his, his body, uh, surely not a choice of his. And, and in a sense, she is too. Because every single day she's been hemmed in, you could say, or not able to just choose to do things that maybe the rest of us choose to do. I visited Pam's dad as well. And, and you know, the same thing with her mom and same thing with Pam, who goes every night to bring her mom home and... You know, that there, are, there are many people that are going through things. I, I, I began thinking about, you know, so many that are here, that through the years, that maybe there's been something, whether it's a child that's went away or, or, or maybe someone that's, that's passed away. And, and, you know, we have these things that maybe, maybe those hurts come from years ago. 
But, but they create sort of a, a grave for us. They create sort of a, a place where, 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 where we're carried in. And, and you know, so, so when Paul and Silas were, were singing with melody to the Lord, when they were giving praise to God, there was all these others around them that were bound. And, and, and they couldn't sing for themselves, but they were listening to the song that was being sung by those that were in prison. I was thinking about Psalm 42.8 that says, you know, that God gives us a song in the night. And in the context of that, that chapter, it was, you know, as the deer pants for the water's brook, so my soul pants after you, O Lord. But the idea is that when you sort of read that chapter, it's also saying that, that my, my, I'm disquieted within me. You know, that there's something going on in my soul. I can't seem to get out of this. But it says here, the Lord will give us a song in the night. Paul writes in, in Ephesians and in Colossians. Let me just turn to those books for a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 21. It says, uh, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here's the will of the Lord. Listen carefully. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now you think about this and... You know, of course, people say, well, I don't drink. I, I, I'm not drinking wine. It's, I don't think this is just about drinking wine. It's about being drunk with the wrong kinds of things. We can be drunk with sorrow. We can be drunk with, with self-pity. We can be drunk with all kinds of things. But the Bible says here, not to be drunk with those things. He says, be filled with the Spirit. We, we need a, a, a baptism of the Spirit in our day like never before. We, we need to ask the Lord to saturate us so, so that we can get over ourselves, get over our issues, get over those things, so that we can begin to speak to one another in psalms and hymns. There's a world around us that is bound. There's a world around us that, that, that is just hemmed in. And, and there's some here as well. We might be going through that season right now. And I'm saying, God's saying, rise up. Rise up, receive the word of the Lord. Let, let the praise come forth so that he can break this bondage that we're walking in. He says in Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do, in word or deed, to all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. So we see in, in Ephesians, he's saying, be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, he's saying, be filled with the Word. It's the Word and the Spirit that helps us to have the right direction to our lives, no matter what season we go through. Look, joy is not dependent on our circumstance. Amen. Paul cried out in the midst of terrible circumstance. And then he urged the Philippian. If you read the Philippian letter, that's something that he wrote after having this experience as he was encouraging the church. But he's urging them to be joyful in the Lord. In fact, 16 times I counted various forms of this word in the short epistle about being joyful or or. Or, or let this joy be in you, or, or be joyous, you know, that, that Paul was able to reflect this attitude when he sat in the jail in Philippi. Look, look suffering is a major deal in Paul's epistles. Uh, I want to just take a little bit of a walk through a few scriptures to, to have, have you write these down, have you think about these things. Second Corinthians, most of these are in Second Corinthians, and we'll look at one in, in Romans as well. 2 Corinthians, let's start with chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. It says, Blessed be the Lord, be, be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. 
Think about this as I'm reading these words. And we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effected for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. But Paul's saying here that unless we go through this ourselves, how can we help to comfort someone else? And this actually is happening and having this work in us so that we can be more, more useful for the kingdom. I know none of us like to go through that. None of us want to experience these things. But, but when we do experience these things, we've got to ask the Lord and say, God, what, what can you do through this experience that will help me to help others? Amen. It says it in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to 18. You know, don't forgive me for re- reading this scripture because I think scripture has more power than any words I can say. Verse 7 says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Think about that for a minute. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So look at this verse. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal." Obviously, I could be preaching on every one of these scriptures that I'm showing you, but I I just want to read them through. Have us consider some things. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that there's something greater in us than ourselves. We, we, we're a cracked pot, but there's light that still can emanate out of that cracked pot. When we allow the Lord to do something in us, that we have a treasure in this earth and vessel. Why? Not so that they can see the excellence of our power, but so they can see the excellence of the power of God that works through us. And there's the key idea here, is that death has to work in us so that life can work in you. In other words, i got to die to some things. How do I learn to die to those things? Except I go through difficult times. But here's what Paul's saying. No matter what this pressure is, no matter how the pressure comes, whether it's persecution or or whatever is happening, we don't lose heart. Why? Because God's doing something inwardly that's greater than what he's doing outwardly. He sees this as light affliction. We might at the moment see this as heavy affliction. But Paul's trying to compare this to eternity. He's trying to compare this to what's the eternal weight of glory. What's God trying to do in us and through us that's going to last for eternity, even though we're in the midst of a storm right now? 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 28. Paul's talking about the reluctant, you know, actually he had this second Corinthians, he had to really come back and deal with his own authority as an apostle, even though he didn't like to be able to wield that, he'd rather appeal to people. But then he says here, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm speaking like a fool. I am more. In labor is more abundant and stripes above measure. Look, look at this. These are qualifications of Paul. In labor is more, I work harder, he says. In stripes above measure, I, I, I bear these stripes. In prisons more frequently. In death's offering, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. If you can't do the math, that's 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils, perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides all the other things that comes upon me daily because of my deep concern for all the churches. Okay, how many of you want to have the anointing of Paul? We, we like the anointing of Paul, but we don't want the shaping of Paul, Right? He goes on to say, you, you see here in all of the things that he, that he had to go through and all the things that he was dealing with, even in chapter 12, he's dealing with a prayer saying, God, take something away from me. Take this thorn away from me. Take this thorn of flesh. And what does the Lord answer him? Verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. How many of you like that word? God say, I'm not going to remove this. This is an area, and some people think, well, maybe it had to do with a pride issue in Paul's life, that God said, I'm not going to remove this. If I remove this, you'd be off doing something in pride. You'd be doing something in your own strength. You'd be doing something in your own intellect. I mean, Paul was an intellectual man. He, he was well-learned. He was well-schooled. You know, he... he, he he was good at arguing. He, he definitely had a lot of zeal. And yet God says, I need to show you some things in your life. I need to redirect some things in your life. One more scripture. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Again, Paul says this. In the context of this, though, there's a wrestle here between the sonship and, and walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. And Paul says this, I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, Paul, Paul's always looking at the future. He's always looking and saying, you know what, I might be passing through something, but I'm making this determination that this suffering right now that I'm going through, this suffering right now that you're going through, it is not worthy to be compared with the value that's going to come as a result of this. Look, look what he says after this. For the earnest expectations of the cre creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. There are people all around us that are going through their own sufferings, but they're looking for the revelation of the sons of God that we can show them something better. Amen. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. I was thinking how in Jesus' life, he healed many people on the earth. There are many that were delivered. But only three recorded resurrections. There was a, a young girl that had just passed that he rose from the dead. There was a young man who they were on their way to bury him. And Jesus rose him from the dead. Then there was the old man Lazarus. Three days in the grave and he resurrected him. 
You know, it didn't matter what the condition of death was. It, you know, the, one of the bodies was still warm. The other one was cold for a day. The, the last one had already been begin to stink. And yet Jesus had the power to raise them from the dead. He could take them out of that situation of deadness. And yet the same thing is, this is only that's recorded of Jesus in his death. But in Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53, said that in, the, in his death was the beginning of many resurrections. Let's look there. You don't believe me. <laughs> Matthew 27. Matthew 27. I've got to prove everything over here. But. Look at verse 52 and 53. Let me start in verse 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. In other words, he died. And behold, a veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, not only were these resurrected, but in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the resurrection and how Jesus is the first fruits of many resurrections. That you and I who believe in him will also be resurrected. But you, uh, the thought is this, is that it's through death that resurrection came. Nobody's listening to me over here. I heard one yap over here. <laughs> Did you understand something? Jesus said, unless a seed goes into the ground and dies, there's no life that comes forth. Why do we read these things and don't apply it to our own lives? Why, why do we read these things and somehow think that there's some foreign thing happened to us when we suffer? In Ephesians 4, 8, it says Jesus led captivity captive. He, he, he not only went into the grave, but then he preached to those who had been of old and he led them out from that captivity because he now has the keys of hell and death. Amen. Look, when, 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 when God called Paul in Acts 9, I'm gonna, let's go there. Yeah. I just want to show you the stuff in the Bible here. It's not stuff I make up. When Paul was on his road. He, he was persecuting Christians. He was doing his own thing. God gave him a revelation. He knocked them off his horse. Some of us need to be knocked off our horse. Amen? Amen. And, and, and as he spent this time blind, then he gets a prophet to come and speak to Paul. Yeah, this was a difficult thing for this prophet to do because he knew who Paul was. He knew what Paul was doing. He carried letters. He, he watched Stephen get stoned. You know, he, he was persecuting the, the, the church. But the Lord says to Ananias this, he says in verse 15 and 16, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. How'd you like that kind of call? <laughs> God said, I'm, 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 I'm like you. I'm, I'm going to do something with you. you you've, been go, you've been on your high horse. You've been going in the wrong direction. I'm going to turn you around and put you in the right direction. But guess what? You're going to follow me. You're going to search for me. But, but you're going to suffer a lot of things for my name's sake. I wonder if we preach that at everyone's ordination, if it make a difference. Maybe we should preach that when we're really speaking about the gospel because somehow we're, we're expecting the gospel to be some kind of easy street, some easy button, some kind of thing that, okay, we just got some insurance from hell, but we're, we're not really called to be disciples because Jesus was pretty clear when you read the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to be persecuted. Look, we're going to go before kings. You know, yes, but you're also going to be, you know, people are going to turn you in. How many are you going to lose your life? You read in Acts chapter 14, in, in verse 19 to 20, Paul, when he was in, in Lystra, preaching the gospel on the first missionary journey, 
guess what? They stoned him. They left him for dead. But the Bible says that the disciples gathered around him and raised him up. I don't know if Paul died and, and, and was resurrected, or, or if they just he was mostly dead, and, and, and somehow they nurtured him. But the fool went back in the city and preached the next day. Jesus called Paul, and Paul gave his life for the church, gave his life for the Lord. In this stoning, there's a young man that saw, that witnessed. His name was Timothy. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, you read about Timothy, who now has among the brethren a good testimony, a good report. And Paul now takes Timothy with him on his second missionary journey. Actually, Timothy is on this journey where Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. He, he had been, you know, so this, this young man, went through Paul's suffering of stoning, a new young leader rose up who witnessed what had taken place. And, and when, when this imprisonment took place in Philippi, a church was formed and a jailer was saved. I mean, think about this church. One woman that sells purple, a slave girl, and now a jailer. These are the first three members that we read about this church. But this church was endearing to Paul and was strategic in making and seeing that this mission continue. Through Paul's sufferings, his imprisonments, many of the New Testament letters that we read came about. It's through our sufferings that we either become bitter or better. It's through our sufferings that we either become more proud and arrogant or we become humble. Because pride will hold us, but faith will propel us. Suffering can bring life if we allow God's work to shape us. Look at James chapter 1. Verse 2 to 4. So after Hebrews, James writes this. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How, how many of you enjoy trials? James is saying, Count it joy, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. That word can also mean uh, endurance, it could also mean perseverance. But let Patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, and that word also can be mature, and complete and lacking nothing. Now, I think I just wrote on this last night a little bit, but when you think about this word, is it possible that we don't let patience have its perfect work in us? In other words, we go through the trial, but we don't really learn from the trial. We, we don't really seek to find out, God, what are you trying to do or teach me in the midst of this trial? Maybe we become bitter because of what somebody did to us or, 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 or somebody, you know, whatever. Rather than saying, God, maybe there's something in my life that needs to break. Maybe there's something in my life that needs to change. Maybe there's something in my life that, that I just need to... Yield and allow you to do the work that's necessary. Here's the big question that I'm looking for. There are people all around us that are trapped, confined, hemmed in. Maybe they're in bondage to an addiction. Maybe they're in bondage to a past hurt. You know, they're in a prison cell. Could be one of their own making or could be one that somebody else made for them. Here's the question. What are they hearing from us? Is it a heartfelt prayer that we're offering in the midst of our own struggle? Is it hymns that they hear us sing? Is there any trust or hope or assurance of peace that, that they can look to through our situation to give them hope for theirs? 
Paul puts this uh, in perspective in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Eight and nine, he's, he deals with focus here. He says, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's not giving them words that he wasn't willing to live out himself. Paul is saying, you saw me go through difficult things. You saw me raised from the dead, if that's what it was. You saw me be in the prison cell. You saw me still offer praise to God. Here's how I did it. Now you do it. In chapter 3, back up a little bit. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Paul says, I count all these things lost. He's talking about all the things he did in life, about everything that was before him, about all his accomplishments, about all his pedigree. He says, I count all these things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul saying it doesn't matter what I've been through. He's worth it. And I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that is from God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. For by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul's saying, look, you've got to put things in perspective. Whatever loss we've been through, whatever circumstance we're facing, whatever difficulties we might be, whatever prisons that we've had to sit in, Paul's saying, look, I'm, I'm putting this past. I'm I, I understanding, even if this is a present situation, to know him, to know the resurrection, the power of his resurrection, to know the, the, the depth of his suffering, the fellowship of his suffering. L let me tell you this. You can't know the power of his resurrection until you've known the, the fellowship of his suffering. Because it's once you've known the, the suffering that you know it said Jesus is the one that raises us up. Paul saying, verse 12, not that I've already attained. And was, I, I, you know, I'm working through this just like you are. Or I'm already perfected. In other words, I, I'm still being shaped by the Lord. But I'm pressing on. That I might lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold for me. You know, Jesus Christ has given you purpose. He's got a plan for your life. Amen. He's got a walk for you to walk in. He, he's got people for you to reach. He's got all these things. But you need to be able to walk and grab a hold of what he has purpose for you. And so, brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended those I'm still on the way. But one thing I do, forget those things which are behind. There's some things you're not going to be able to change in life. No matter how you look at it, you can't go back and change it. I think any of us, if we had the, the chance, probably would go change something. Then we go make some other mistakes. You understand? It's like we, we you know, it, it'd be nice to kind of know what you know now and start life again, right? But that doesn't happen that way. You go start life again, you'll be still young and dumb like you were before. <laughs> now we're just old and dumb. Paul says, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forget those things which are behind. Reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul counted everything lost that he could gain Christ, that I might know him. That I, that I might know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, that I might know him in, in, in the power of his resurrection. Can, can I say one word to the church? We need to arise. We need to arise. Yes. Tell that to somebody. We need to arise. We need to press on. 
We, we need to press on. You know, other people are depending on us pressing on. Amen. There's people all around us that are in their grave cloths. I can only picture Jesus as he resurrected Lazarus. Even his close friends, Mary and Martha, who believed in him, still had doubt to what Jesus could do in that situation. I mean, Jesus was the resurrection and the life. He was there, present, and they're saying, if you only had been. Look at this. Jesus tells them to roll back the stone. The one who broke an alabaster box, who had worshipped at Jesus' feet, says, stinks by now. You know something? Jesus doesn't care about stink. He's the God of stink. He can resurrect the stink. He can bring life where there's stink. So he says, roll back the stone, and then he says, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> Lazarus obeyed, but he still was bound up in cloth. And Jesus said to those around, he says, remove his grave cloths. <coughs> Can I say another word to the church? We need to remove our grave cloths. Amen. Where we can't remove it, others need to help us to remove those grave cloths. Because he's told us to arise. He wants us to live. Look, maybe you're comfortable in the grave cloths, but I'm telling you, you can't do the work that God's called you to do while you're all bound up. It takes loving each other. It takes working with each other. It, it's, you know, we, we can't always understand the hurt that somebody else is going through. We might not have experienced the same thing, but we've experienced some things. And based on the things that we've experienced, we can come with compassion to others. And say, I might not be able to understand everything, but you know what? As I've trusted the Lord in my life, I've been comforted. And he can comfort you too. Amen. Amen. It's time for us to arise. It's time for us to deal with some of the things. There's some people here and some that are not even here. There's been years that you haven't dealt with some things. You're still not moving with God because of things that happened years ago. The Lord's saying to our church, it's time to reach out. It's time to reach our neighbors. It's time to reach our family. But how can a bound people unbind people? The work begins in the household of God. Amen. God's calling us to humble ourselves, but what's the next thing? It says to seek his face. We, we need to enter a season of seeking the face of the Lord. But I believe God is speaking to us here. Yes. He's saying it's time to arise. Yeah. It's time to arise. It's time for us to put face to work. Because you know what? What I say, what I preach has no meaning unless you see in my life some reality when I go through a difficult time. Yeah. And those are the reality checks for all of us. Amen? Amen? But God is accomplishing something greater in us that's of eternal weight and his glory. So if we can see that in all of eternity... Paul's saying, it's just a little bit of time. Let's put it in perspective. Let's ask the Lord to have his perfect work in us as we trust him. Amen? Amen. I want to be someone that can sing a song in the night when things are not good, when you might feel like you're all bound up, but we can cry out to him with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because we've been filled with the Spirit of God and we've been filled with the Word of God and we know that we can trust Him. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you today. Lord, we, we just don't want to have any kind of just a regular prayer that's ineffective. Your, your scripture says that the effective prayer of a righteous man and a woman can avail much. So, Lord, we come to you. 
And Lord, we, we, we not only pray for others, we pray for ourselves right now, Lord. If there be any way that we've been bound in, help us, Lord. Help us to walk out of the grave. Help us to allow others to touch us a little bit so that we can loosen up the things that we've allowed to be wrapped around us. Lord, let deliverance come to our church, to our people, so we can be free and we can be able to help others. That We can learn from our own struggles and sufferings to be able to bring comfort to those that are all around us. Lord, we glorify you and we thank you. I can thank you that in the, in the deepest troubles of whatever precious I have felt in my life, you're always there. And when maybe, if I personally have wanted to recede, my love for others has kept me from doing so. And in reality, it's helping others that I get help too. So Lord, as we prepare even now for our time of communion, we remember your life, your suffering, your death, but we also call to mind your covenant and your resurrection. New life can be formed if we let some things die. So have your perfect work in us, Lord. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.